thankful for our college students here at Morningside. We have a couple hundred in our rooted college ministry, and I'm thankful that many of them are musicians who lead us in worshiping every Lord's Day. If you have a Bible, let's turn to Mark chapter 12. Mark 12, as we've been going through our theme this year, Beneath the Cross, uh, looking at Mark's gospel. When I debated in college, one of the most interesting times in every single debate was the cross-examination. And uh, I actually read, this is an actual court transcript of a lawyer questioning a medical examiner. The lawyer says, doctor, before you performed the autopsy, did you check for a pulse? Examiner, no. Lawyer, did you check for blood pressure or breathing? No. Lawyer, so then it's possible the patient was alive when you began the autopsy. Examiner, no. Lawyer, how can you be so sure, doctor? Examiner, because his brain was sitting on my desk in a jar. Lawyer, but could the patient have still been alive nevertheless? Examiner, it is possible he could have been alive and practicing law somewhere. (laughs) In Mark chapter 12, a lawyer and a series of religious leaders are trying to cross-examine Jesus. And every time they ask him a leading or a baiting question, his response ends up making them look foolish, and yet they keep coming back. And so here they come again in verse 14 with another try. They ask, is it lawful to give tribute or tax to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? So that's the question that we're going to take up this morning. What should you give to government? Jesus says, first of all, in verse 15, you should give government taxes. That was the question that they asked. Should we give taxes to Rome? Of course, they're trying to trick him. If he says yes, then the people, the Jewish people who hated Rome, are going to turn against Jesus. If he says no, he could be tried for the crime of sedition to the Roman Empire and he could lose his life. And so either way Jesus answers, they think they have him trapped. They think they have him in a corner. So how does Jesus answer? Verse 15. But Jesus knowing their hypocrisy. We, lost, we saw last time how they, they use obvious flattery in verse 14, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. So Jesus asked them for a denarius, and they brought it, and he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they say unto him, Caesar's. See, the Roman emperor was the only one who could cause the production of silver coins, who could mint silver coins like this one, this denarius. In fact, you can still find a denarius today. Archaeologists have discovered many of them. I've seen one before in a museum. And on the front of the denarius was the face of Tiberius, uh, clearly this Roman emperor, and the superscription says Tiberius Caesar August son of the divine Augustus. The Roman emperor claimed to be the divine son of God. Now, you can imagine why this was so offensive to the Jewish people. First of all, what's the second commandment? If you remember the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, Exodus 20, what's the second commandment? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. So the the Jewish people would look at that and say, this is clearly an engraved image. It's idolatrous. But not only that, about 20, 30 years earlier in 17 BC, Augustus had declared the forgiveness of all of the subjects of the Roman Empire. He said, I grant you forgiveness and in honor of this edict that he had made, he actually minted a coin where he he proclaimed himself, like this coin, to be the very Son of God. So this is his son's 2.0 version of that same blasphemy. So these, these men are coming to Jesus, trying to bait him and asking him, what do you think about paying taxes to Caesar? He says, well, show me one of these coins. Show me one of these blasphemous coins. They're hoping that he's going to get so furious, he'll say something seditious, and that Rome will execute him. But instead, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, what's in your wallet? And so here, these 
pious Pharisees with all their political posturing of these pagan Romans and how dare they force us to have an engraved image, these idolatrous currency. And, and, and he says, what's in your wallet? And they, they're the ones that have the denarius. They're the ones who hypocritically produce this Roman denarius. Jesus is penniless. Jesus doesn't have anything in his wallet. So they're the ones, in spite of all their pious platitudes and political posturing, they're the ones that actually have this pagan denarius. And so with red faces, they have to produce the coin. They pull out the coin and show it to Jesus. Verse 17. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. So Jesus says, look, if, if you're going to carry around this blasphemous coin made by Caesar, it's got his image on it. He owns it. He minted it. If he wants his dirty blasphemous coin back, then shouldn't you give it back to him? It'd be like if someone came to a religious leader today and said, do, do we really have to pay taxes to Washington? And he says, well, show me a dollar. And they pull out a dollar and he says, well, who's... Whose face is that on the dollar? And they say, it's Washington's. And he says, okay, we'll render to Washington the things that already belong to Washington anyway. Why is the Bible very clear that we as people of faith, we as Christians, should in fact pay taxes? It's because civil authority is what we call a means of common grace. That the, the civil authority that God has established in our community in 2,000 years ago in the Jewish world, that civil authority is a means of common grace. It's the reason we have clean running water and roads to drive on as long as the debris from Hurricane Zeta has been cleared off. It, in fact, this is the reason that we can meet freely as a people without threat of, of interference. It's the reason that we can drive to church without being afraid of being shot at. It's because of the common grace of our civil authority, of our thin blue line that we honored last week. This is why you as our civil leaders are the ones that cause our community to flourish. This is why so many people want to come to Greenville because you are doing such a great job. Everybody wants to come to Greenville. Our community is flourishing because of our civil authority, because of the common grace that God allows through your leadership. And, and that's what the Jewish people were experiencing. Caesar provided that same flourishing for the Jews. He had built roads. All roads lead to Rome. He had built aqueducts and bridges that provided water. He gave military protection. They enjoyed the Pax Romana. The peace of Rome that throughout the ancient known world, the Mediterranean world, there was this modicum at least of peace because of the Roman Empire that everybody enjoyed. And so Jesus says it's only fair if Caesar provides all of this for you and Caesar's the one who minted this coin, give it back to him if he wants it. You should pay something for these services. So Jesus affirms a government's right to collect taxes because they are a God-ordained institution. God has ordained government for our protection, for our well-being, for our flourishing, even a pagan government. So Jesus says, number one, you should give government taxes. Number two, he says, you should give government submission. This we see more clearly elaborated by Peter, who would have been standing and, and witnessing this interchange. And he later, in 1 Peter chapter 2, says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, for so is the will of God. This is God's will, that you would submit for the Lord's sake to the leaders that God has placed in your life. Now, you say, well, who was the king? Who was the emperor when Peter wrote that letter 2,000 years ago? It was Nero. Was Nero a friend of the faith community? No, what did Nero do with Christians? He, he entertained with Christians. He, he fed them to the lions in the Colosseum or sent them out to die before the gladiators. He used them for decoration. He would dip Christians in oil and use them as tiki torches in his garden for his drunken 
orgies. He would burn Christians alive. This was a government leader who was no friend of the faith community, and yet, here's Peter saying, submit yourselves to the king. Submit to the governor. Submit to the emperors. This is God's will for you to submit. Pastor John MacArthur put it this way, by God's own sovereign decree, presidents, kings, prime ministers, governors, mayors, police, and all of the government authorities stand in His place, in God's place, as it were, for the preservation of society. To resist government is therefore to resist God, to refuse to pay taxes is to disobey God's command. You say, is there ever a time that I should refuse to submit to government? If government commands what God forbids or forbids what God commands, that's the only time when we say, I ought to obey God rather than man. Otherwise, what do we give to, govern to, to our governing authorities? We give them taxes when they ask for taxes and we give them submission. Third, the Bible teaches you should give honor. This is Peter again in 1 Peter 2 in the 17th verse. He says, honor the emperor. Again, this isn't Mr. Rogers. This is Nero. This is a maniacal dictator who's stamping out Christianity, who's burning Christians alive. Or, or think about when Daniel emerges from the lion's den and the first thing he sees is King Darius the one who, who said, everybody needs to pray for me, to pray to me, or they'll be cast into the lions. This is the guy who just tried to have him executed by lions. Daniel emerges from the lion's den. He sees King Darius. What's the first thing that he says? You pagan jerk. How dare you do this? No. He says, O oh, king, live forever. You say, wait a second. How could a follower of Yahweh honor a pagan king like that? Was Daniel a sellout? No. Daniel understood that who had put Darius on that throne? God had. And so to dishonor Darius would be to dishonor God's will. Daniel also knew from Psalm chapter 2 that God laughs at any king who seeks to compete with him. Psalm 2 says he, he laughs. He holds them in derision. God's eternal threat, Daniel recognized God's eternal threat was far greater than Darius' existential threat. And so that's why he obeys God and he honors Darius. By the way, Tuesday night, a month from now, when we get the election results, <laughs> if, if you look at those election results and, and you think this winner of the election poses an existential threat to God's people, remember Daniel was in a lion's den. There, there isn't a, a much greater existential threat to your life than being thrown into a den of hungry lions. And yet Daniel still shows honor to the king. Jesus commands us, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. I would argue in a democratic republic that not only should we render taxes to Caesar, but we should render our civic duty. That, that as Christians, we should exercise our right and our duty to vote, that going to the polls is, is a way of following an application of Christ's command here to render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. You may not respect all the people who are running for office, but as a Christian, you must respect the office. That is a God-ordained office, and for God's sake, we should respect the office. We should respect the authority. We should honor them. It's interesting, in Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 13, he kind of sums up all three of these Christian duties to government. See if you can see all three of these in this, this one passage. He says, let every soul be subject. That means submit. That's our first one. Submit unto the higher powers. For there's no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. For this cause pay ye tribute also. We're to pay taxes. For they are God's ministers. You, as our civil leaders, are, are called ministers of God. I'm not the only minister in this room. You all are ministers of God. Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whose cu custom is due, fear to whom fear is due, honor to whom honor is due. And that's why we're honoring our civil leaders this Sunday. Not only because we do appreciate the job that you're doing, we do appreciate the flourishing of our community because of your work, of our state because of your work, but also because God commands us to honor those to whom honor is due. And so what should you give the government? Taxes, submission, 
honor. Now on the flip side, what does he say you should give to God? What does Jesus say we as Christians should give to God? And the answer is you should give God everything. When we think about this passage, our minds usually go to that famous phrase, render to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar. But the second phrase in verse 17 is far more significant. And render to God the things that are God's. See, we owe God much more than coins or taxes or an IRS form. We owe Him our very lives. If you look at verse 30 here in Mark chapter 12, Jesus is going to say, what is the the first commandment? What is the most fundamental commandment that you can really hang all the other commandments of Scripture on? He says, to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. To love Him with everything that you are. These coins were stamped with the image of Caesar. And so Jesus says, then they belong to Caesar. Genesis 1.26 tells us at the very beginning, we were stamped with the Imago Dei. We were stamped with the image of whom? Of God. So who do we belong to? To God. And this is why if a human institution, whether it's in the, the home, the institution of the home, if parents or the institution of government or the church, if in any of those three institutions, the leadership use that leadership role that's been given to them by God abusively, and they command you as as your parents or your church or your government to disobey, to break God's law, you must obey God rather than man. The Christian owes Caesar something, but not everything. The demands of God are infinitely more great greater than the demands of of government, as important as those are. We see this throughout Scripture. All the way back in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 1, there are these Hebrew midwives who are commended because they fear God more than they fear the edict of Pharaoh to commit Jewish male infanticide. Pharaoh says, kill all the Jewish male infants. They say, no, we fear God more than we fear Pharaoh. In Daniel chapter 3, there are these, these three Hebrew boys who are are told you have to bow down to this huge, gigantic statue of Nebuchadnezzar or you'll be thrown into a superheated furnace. And they say, as much as we respect the king, they worked for the king, they were government employees. But they said, as much as we respect the king, we cannot disobey God to obey the king. And their fear of God paid off because when they're thrown into the superheated furnace, God protects them. We see the same thing in Daniel chapter 6 when Daniel does disobey Darius as much as he loved and respected Darius as his boss. He refuses to say, I will only pray to Darius. I'm going to pray to Yahweh. And so he continues to pray even when it means the threat of the lion's death. Or we see the apostles in Acts chapter 5. They are imprisoned and beaten for preaching the good news of Jesus. And as they're released, they're commanded, don't do it again but they say, no, we must obey God rather than men. Like Daniel, we should submit to government, even to a pagan one, as far as we can. But when God and government collide, we must obey God. His image is not stamped on our money, although our U.S. currency does say in God we trust. But His image is actually stamped on us. We bear the image of God. God owns everything. Caesar owned the denarius, but he didn't own his subjects. The state doesn't own you. God does. He has the supreme right to claim you as his own. Everything that you have, your life, your liberty, your pursuit of happiness, your affections belong to him. And so this Tuesday, not just for the government's sake, as important as that is, vote, but vote for God's sake. Vote for Christian principles. We We've seen what the Bible tells us we should give government. Honor, submission, taxes. But we've also seen what the Bible says we should give God, and that is everything. We bear His image. He has claim over every part of our life. But there's something the Bible says that we should give to both God and to government. Can anyone guess what that is? Prayer. Now, now as Christians, we all know that we're supposed to pray. We Recognize that's fundamental to being Christians is that we understand we are dependent creatures. We must have God's strength. We must have God's grace. We must have God's forgiveness. If you've never experienced that, 
If you cannot call God Father, I would invite you. We're, we have pastors who will be available after the service. To, one of us would love to show you how you can receive the grace of God, how you can receive that forgiveness. Well, forgiven people give back. They give to their community, but they give prayer to God. We, we are a dependent people. We recognize that we need to pray. And so hopefully we pray to God regularly. But the, but the Bible also tells us we need to pray for our nation. We need to pray specifically for our leaders. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul's writing to his protege that he'd mentored in the faith, and he tells Timothy, he says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. Four categories of prayer be made for all men, but then he narrows it down for kings and for all that are in authority. We are, we are to pray for those who are in authority that they would do what's right, that they would judge righteously, that they would create laws that are righteous and just laws that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. We need to pray for our leaders to pray for this election, for, for those who will be put in authority after Tuesday night or whenever the ballots are, are sorted out. We need to pray for them. On June 6, 1944, one of the most powerful forces in the history of the world, the U.S. military began one of the most well-planned invasions in world history, something that we now call D-Day. And it was the, the perfect combination of this immense military might and a massive secret operation as the U.S. Was, was finally recognizing we have to invade Europe, we've got to take Hitler out, that's the only way to win. And yet, even though we had this magnificent military might and this incredible strategic plan, were Americans, were the leaders of our nation puffed up with pride? Were we resting on our laurels? No, what, what were we doing as a nation? We were praying. On D-Day, President Roosevelt got on the radio and he led the entire nation in prayer. All of the networks broadcast it. Newspapers printed it. At 2200 Eastern Wartime, the president prayed while Americans across the country joined him. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation this day, have set upon a mighty endeavor. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. These men yearn for the end of the battle, for their return to the haven of home. Some will never return. Embrace these, Father, and receive them. Thy heroic servants into thy kingdom. And, O Lord, give us faith. Give us faith in thee. Thy will be done, Almighty God. Amen. The New York Daily News threw out its lead articles and in their place printed the Lord's Prayer. The New York Stock Exchange called for two minutes of silent prayer at the opening bell. Lord and Taylor Department Store never opened in New York that day. President Hoving said that he was sending all 3,000 employees across the country home to pray. The Bible says we owe government and God not only our civic duty, to pay taxes, to honor government, to submit to government, to vote when we have the opportunity. But we owe both God and government our prayer. And so I'm going to ask you as church members not only to exercise your civic duty to vote in the next couple days, but over the course of the next two days to take time to create space to fast and pray for our nation. On Tuesday, we're going to have a special prayer meeting in our chapel at 1 o'clock with all of the, the pastors, with all with different leaders of the church, just spending time praying. We're, we're, we're going to, as always, be a polling place. So in the gym, people from the community will be coming in and casting their vote. But in our chapel, we as God's people, as believers, want to be on our knees praying for our nation. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven and heal their land. Let's stand this morning with our heads bowed and our hearts open. We as, as believers recognize that we're a needy people. We are dependent on our Heavenly Father. We, we need His strength. We need His grace. We need His forgiveness. I wonder if there's someone here this morning who's never received God's forgiveness 
who, who's never received God's grace, who's never said, I'm going to turn from trying to do life my way, from my sin, and I'm going to turn and trust Jesus to be my Savior. Trust that God sent His only Son to pay our penalty on the cross. And I would like to receive that grace this morning. Is there anyone like that this morning who would just slip up your hand and say, I would like to receive that grace. I would like to know how I can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Many of you are believers this morning. And I would encourage you not only to, to vote, to, to do the bare minimum as a citizen of, of exercising your right to vote, but will you fast and pray for the election of our government leaders? As our musicians minister to us this morning, let's, let's keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed. We want to take just a, a short time of prayer and reflection and, and ask ourselves, do I have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? And am I, as a Christian, giving government what government is due, but also giving God what He is due, everything that I am and everything that I have? Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the clear instruction that Jesus has given us to uh, honor our government leaders, to submit to their rule that's for our good, and to, to pay taxes. Father, I pray that we would be a people who are lifting up each of these leaders who are with us this morning, as well as other government leaders in prayer on a regular basis, remembering that you have made them your ministers, that they serve us as they serve you. And Father, we pray that ultimately our allegiance would be to you and to your kingdom. We thank you for the gift of sending your son to die for us, to die in our place. We pray if there's someone who doesn't know him, uh, that today they would receive his forgiveness. We pray this in his name. Amen. You may be seated. We've just seen our biblical responsibility to our civil leaders. And uh, being in office is not an easy job. I in high school and in college, worked for my congressman in our local office and then in the D.C. office. And I know that it's often a thankless job and a tireless job. And uh, so we, we are thankful for each of these government leaders. Ronald Reagan said, I have left orders to be awakened at any time in case of a national emergency, even if I'm in a cabinet meeting. Um, and, and some of you who've been in, in long meetings in, in government know what that's like. Another president, Bill Clinton, said, being president is like running a cemetery. You've got a lot of people under you, but nobody's listening. <laughs> the, these are not easy jobs. Uh, these are not jobs where they usually get a lot of honor and a lot of praise. But we as Christians should give them the honor that they are due. And so we want to recognize our civil leaders at this time. I'm going to ask if there's anyone who wasn't able to RSVP. Those of you who RSVP'd, we have... Uh, your your uh, photo that we're going to show up on the screen, but anyone who hasn't RSVP'd, if you don't mind just coming down to this mic and sharing your name and the office that you hold or the office that you're running for. Uh, I think I saw Stan Juvalakis. I don't know if there are any, Steve Shaw, if there are any others. If you all don't mind just uh, coming down front and telling us your name and what office you're, you're running for, what office you hold. Oh, that, that was a... <laughs> Hello, my name is Steve Shaw. I'm running for Greenville County Council District 20, Harris Mountain, Pebble Creek, and Taylor area. Good morning. My name is Stan Juvalakis, and I'm running for County Council District 22. And if by the grace of God I'm elected, I will be serving behind one amazing leader that's been in, at Greenville County for so many years. And uh, Dr. Taylor, I just want to tell you, thank you for all you've done for Greenville County and our state. And Ms. Taylor, thank you for always keeping him straight. <laughs> all right, we want to uh, have our civil leaders, after your name is announced, if you'll stand and continue to stand, we'll, we'll hold our applause until the end. Uh, we have with us this morning Glenda Morrison Fair, uh, and 
Glenda is on the Greenville County School Board trustee for Area 23. She also just this week received the highest level of recognition from the South Carolina School Boards Association Boardsmanship Institute in recognition of her service. And we're thankful to have you with us, Glenda, uh, this morning. We also have Linda Leventis Wells, the chair of the Greenville County School Board and uh, representing Area 22. We're thankful to have her with us and, and you all may continue to stand. We'll, we'll hold our applause till the end. Uh, it's good to have one of our own, Tim Nanny, uh, is with us. Tim is the Register of Deeds and a member here at Morningside Baptist Church. It's also good to have another Morningsider, Dr. Bob Taylor, uh, who has been mentioned, has been with the County Council uh, now for 20 years. Uh, Dorothy Dow is with City Council. It's great to have Dorothy with us here this morning. Uh, she's a representative at large for Greenville City Council. Jason Elliott is the South Carolina State House 20, 22nd District representative. So he actually represents our district uh, right here at Morningside. It's good to have Jason with us this morning. Uh, Adam Morgan, uh, as we all know, is a member here at Morningside. He represents the 20th District to the State House. Uh, Mike Burns is another State House representative for the 17th District. It's good to have Mike with us this morning. And then Dwight Loftus is a State Senator, uh, represents the 6th District uh, to Columbia, to our State Senate. It's also great to have William Timmons, a Congressman uh, to the U.S. House of Representatives for the 4th District here with us this morning. And then we're also honored to have our Lieutenant Governor, Pamela Yvette is with us. And so uh, let's show our appreciation to each of these civil leaders for being with us this morning. We do have a gift for each of our civil leaders just as a thank you from our church family. Uh, we appreciate you and, and we pray for you. We teach our little children even to, to start praying for you. Every Wednesday night when we have our prayer meeting, we pray for different civil leaders, government leaders, uh, at the national, state, and local level. So we, we're thankful for you. This time, Lieutenant Governor Evett is going to come and share a word of greeting uh, from the governor uh, this morning. Well, I just want to thank you all so much for having us all here today. I know it's, an, it's our pleasure. Um, you know, we're blessed to be in a state um, that is founded on such Christian principles. You know, government can't do everything. The governor says it all the time. And it's our faith leaders and it's our faith communities that fill that gap here in South Carolina. You know, I was shocked last year when I heard Adam uh, give some words at another leader's um, kind of morning where he talked about in the U.S., Christians are the lowest voting block that we have, which shocked me. Um, I never really thought that to be true because we play such an important role in the day-to-day -day lives of our communities. So thank you so much, um, Pastor. You snuck up on me. <laughs> Thank you so much for your words this morning, because I think this is the first time since I was a small child going to church every Sunday that I've really heard from the pulpit so much talk about this election. And I think what you said um, was very eloquent in why it is our duty, um, because it's your vote uh, that will carry what our country will look like um, in the years to come. And I know it's so important that we can go back and forth about a number of issues. Um, but I know for you, like myself, all issues end with life, because life is a non-negotiable if you're a Christian. So thank you all so much for your prayers. Uh, as you pray for us, please remember to keep our family in your prayers too, because even though our job is hard, uh, we go into it as a labor of love, but it's our family who's, they are deeply affected when they hear negative um, words coming from the public um, to the people that they love. So thank you again so much on behalf of all of my colleagues who I respect so much. Um, thank you for your prayers and thank you for having us all here today. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. It is a wonderful privilege that we have not only to, to vote, but even to be active in the political arena. And as Christians, uh, we should seek unity not only among ourselves and in, in our churches and in our families, but unity in our community. And I'm thankful for uh, so many of you who have been active politically, uh, for those in our church who serve in different offices, and for those of you, hundreds of college students here who may one day serve, I would uh, encourage you. I, I loved working in, in the political process when I was a college student, a high school student, look for internship opportunities, look for campaign opportunities. This is a great time in your life uh, to see ways that you can serve your community uh, by being part of the political process. I am thankful for those members of our church who serve as civil leaders, who are willing, like uh, a Daniel uh, to, or a Nehemiah, to stand in the public square and stand for truth uh, while also honoring and respecting the authority that God has placed in our lives. And one of those members of our church who's done that for many years is Dr. Bob Taylor. And so we wanted to surprise him. He, this is the year that he is retiring uh, from a two-decade-long a career as a civil ser servant with our county uh, council. And so I've asked his son-in-law, Tim Nanny, if he would come and read a citation. Uh, Dr. Taylor, if you would come and receive a plaque that we have for you as a, as a church family. In 1976, Dr. Taylor and Elmer Rominger began traveling around the state of South Carolina visiting churches and showing sh short films encouraging Christians to get involved in the political process and express the importance of voting. That year, precinct meetings, precinct meetings attendance increased dramatically and the growth of the Republican Party in South Carolina began. Dr. Taylor served as chairman of the Republican Party in Greenville was a delegate to numerous national conventions and served on the several state and national committees. Dr. Taylor always encouraged Christians to run for office and get involved in their community. He ran a number of local campaigns and in 2000, he ran for office and was elected to Greenville County Council. He has served Greenville County in the capacity for 20 years. During his service in Greenville County and across the state, his greatest desire was to see Christians involved in the political process and to see them stand for the principles and values that Christians hold dear. Let's show our appreciation once again for Dr. Taylor's career. This time we're going to have our choir sing, and as we do every Sunday, we have our first hour as a time of corporate worship together. Uh, then we spend a little bit of time singing, but we do want to give an opportunity for anyone uh, who's high risk or uncomfortable with uh, singing uh, to, to be dismissed. Our next hour, we have Sunday school classes, so we'd welcome any of you as guests or civil leaders to stay and participate in our Sunday school classes. But I hope that you will say thank you to our civil leaders. We do have a gift bag for each of you on your way out. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us this Lord's Day. We'll have the choir sing at that time. If anyone needs to be dismissed, you can. Uh, and then we'll go into a short time of singing and then we'll go to our classes. <laughs> 